pixels and that little science. You're focusing fidget spinners for ultra efficient electricity free blood plasma separation. Yes, so as uh, Dr. Rutolo prefaced, I will be discussing an analytical chemistry paper that was recently featured in the January edition of ACS Headline Science detailing blood plasma separation using a fidget spinner. So a general overview of what I'll be talking about today. We will start with some background information, some motivations for blood plasma separation. Then we'll jump into the paper's proposed design and talk about some design principles that they used in creating this. And then later we're going to examine some data that they used to optimize their technique. And finally, we're going to use that data to compare it to other techniques and its overall impact within this interfusion world. So let's begin about talking about blood. So what is blood? Probably thinking, you know, the red liquid sloshing around inside your body. Pretty simple, right? Well, it's a little bit more complicated. So when you go to get your blood drawn, the blood that you typically get is this whole blood, which is this amalgamated colloidal mixture of different cells in solution, also known as plasma. And the issue with the blood like this is you also have other things like viruses and metabolites in that blood, which can lead to complications during transfusion techniques because your immune system does not like strange blood in their system. And so this leads to what is known as hemolytic complications, which can often be fatal in patients. So our solution for that is let's fractionalize it. Let's separate it into its components, the plasma, the buffy coat, and the erythrocytes, or red blood cells. And so you can see from my diagram on the left here, surprise, blood is not all red. We can also see that the nasty stuff like proteins and bacteria and viruses have been successfully separated out from the cells, which means that it can now be used for other research contexts. And I do say nasty stuff, but really we can use a lot of these proteins in other uh, treatments or different research studies as well. So let's not discount these things quite yet. Just going to give you an overview of what kind of equipment is out there. All sorts of things, really. Since the creation of the first classical centrifuge in 1800s by a classical German uh, cafe owner, scientists have been deriving all sorts of spinning contraptions to separate out blood. And so as a point of comparison, I've chosen some familiar techniques. You guys have heard of the microfluidic lab on chip concept, where if you recall that the main driving force for a lot of these things is pressure driven or electricity driven. So for instance, I have this dual elbowed micro channel here that is propelled through pressure as well as facilitated with electricity. However, there's been more recent push in the community to create an easily accessible, electricity-free centrifugal source. Uh, everyone's in on this, for everyone from the West Coast. So you have Stanford here creating the Whirly Gig Paperfuge, which is based on a toy that separates out once the uh, strings are intertwined, and then they will separate and have this pinwheel in the middle spin very rapidly around and around. On the East Coast, you have Harvard with their egg beater design where you buy an egg beater at a local store, take off one side of it, uh, add the blood tube to one side, and then manually turn it to separate out the blood. And even our own university is in on the action with a Michigan startup known as Centricycle, creating these hand crank centrifuges for rural places in India. So you may be wondering, what has all these universities like motivated to study this? And for them, it's this big vision of a medicinal science world where we can bring point of care testing to the bedside where providers are able to swiftly diagnose diseases and commence treatment plans of action. In particular, this technology aims to like remove a lot of the labor intensive steps and helps us keep good samples without wasting too many. Also, it's used in forensic serology for similar purposes to help catch criminals quicker. So the easily accessible these things are, the quicker the turnaround time that we can perform in labs for this sort of technology. And another field that's kind of overlooked is chemistry and biology education, which means that if it's accessible, we can teach it in our schools for the next generation of chemists and biologists. And so jumping into the primary paper here, the authors propose to use a plastic fidget spinner as a centrifugal device. And for those unfamiliar, fidget spinners are these multi-lobe toys, traditionally with three lobes. Here's an example you can pass around. And they have the ball bearing at the center, which allows the device to rotate without significant effort. And so this infographic here depicts the workload and the workflow for how they plan to detect diseases, uh, keeping the low budget theme, polyethylene tubing, which they pipette blood into, and then they seal it and crimp it with pliers. Once we have that, we carefully fasten it to the prongs of the fidget spinner, spin it to centrifuge. And then afterwards, we can cut it with scissors and then use it for biomedical detection. This paper particularly uses paper enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, or PLISA techniques. However, the eventual goal is to get these rapid diagnostic tests where you dip a paper in and you say, oh, I have HIV, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to talk about some of these parameters which the authors use to optimize this technique. So let's talk about some physics behind fidget spinners and centrifuges. Here's an animation of 
such a technique, we will treat the sample as a point mass of m. And then likely from your physics classes, you guys know that uh, these samples are subjected to centripetal forces. So as the centrifuge rotates, particles operate under this sedimentation principle, where the denser particles or heavier particles will move to the outward and settle towards the bottom, whereas low density particles will move to the center and rise to the top. One of the main optimization parameters that the authors wanted to address was the speed of this fidget spinner. They obtained these following data points using a digital tachometer to measure RPM. And for those interested, I dug up the schematic of it, which you'll see some similar components that we've seen in class. You have an IR laser detector here that goes into a summing op amp that has a digital analog converter, which gives out your NPN type transistors into a ready for your how, much, how fast the fidget spinner is going. Um, and although you can see there's some variability within fidget spinning speed, you can see that it has an average of around 1200 RPM, which is sufficient for blood plasma separation. If the authors wanted to have more precise data, they could tighten the ball bearing at the center of the fidget spinner, which would allow for a reduction of variability. Plot B here tracks the ramping and deceleration as time progresses, and plot C demonstrates a random sample of different individuals' first interactions with the toy. Although it's very random and a little bit low, the uh, authors affirm that with much practice, anyone can spin it at 1200 RPM. And so let's move on to the second parameter here. It's the placement of the sample with regards to the axis of the fidget spinner. So they mark the center mass of each tube on the sample and then place it a distance from the center of the axis of the fidget spinner. Here we see some of the key uh, measurement parameters that we want to study here. We have the plasma yield, which is the volume of plasma you separated out over the volume of the whole blood. And you also have the purity as well, which includes the number of red blood cell contaminants in the plasma divided by the number of whole blood. As they move the sample further out, we notice that optimal rotation radius at 45 millimeters. But you're probably thinking, that's a little strange, right? Because I just told you that from centripetal force, if the radius is higher, then we'll have higher plasma purity due to greater centrifugal force. Um, and the authors attribute this, as you see here in plot C, uh, the 40 millimeter tube has one consistent segmented blood section here. However, in the 50 millimeter tube, there was uh, segmentation in the blood, which is likely due to the fact that the sample was moved too far out on the fidget spinner, causing centrifugal imbalance during separation. So in summary, a 40 or 45 millimeter length is the optimal length at which fidget spinners are perfectly balanced, as all things should be. Next, the authors investigated the <laughs> effect of sample volume on the plasma yields. And we see that the amount you get from a simple finger prick is roughly 5 to 15 microliters. We tested and we found that the 10 microliter sample range yields the most plasma by comparison to the overall sample volume. There's no real theory behind this. It's just purely experimental data. But the important part is that you can receive uh, enough plasma volume to do your tests from a simple finger prick. And I'd also like to note at this point that the plasma purity across all these tests have been nearly 99 percentile. Finally, the authors investigated whether the age of the whole blood plays a role in the separation. As expected, older blood is a lot more difficult to separate out due to its uh, viscosity factors associated with clotting. And older blood also runs the uh, risk of hemolysis, which is where red blood cells kind of explode and leave hemoglobin throughout, which makes it almost impossible to separate out. So as you can see here by day 11, we can still get some of it out, but you're noticing that it's a lot more difficult to separate out the red region from the yellow region. And by day 19, there's no way to separate anything out. But do note, again, that the plasma purity is still extremely pure. I mentioned at the beginning that they use a conventional PLISA biomedical detection test to test this technique um, for disease detection. And although this isn't the focus of the paper, I do like to talk about it quickly for a little bit. You have these cellulose uh, wells here which are coated in antigen proteins. And then plasma spiked with different levels of a P24, which is a biomarker of HIV, was poured out into these wells. And then you can have these proteins bind to these antigens. And then these wells are then washed with blocking buffer to remove unbound proteins. And then the, detec the detection of antibodies covalently conjugated with an enzyme are mixed in. And then finally, after washing again, a colorogenic substrate is mixed in, which allows the, the uh, well to change color, which can then finally be analyzed using image J on a smartphone. And so this right-hand plot here displays the calibration curve of the red and blue colored levels of the wells. And we find that their limit of detection is 0.03 nanograms per milliliter. The error bars here can be accounted for by the internal interfaces of the plasma content. Finally, they compared this to actual blood centrifuge in a super speed centrifuge and found that the fidget spinner separated blood was 98% similar to that separated by a centrifuge. And so that brings us to using all this data to 
comparing it to other techniques, which I've best summarized for you in this little table here. I've looked through different papers. The centrifuge ones were particularly difficult to quantify because not a lot of the papers are looking to minimize the amount of sample volume, and different centrifuge models are used. But we can see from this data generally that the fidget spinner actually does measure up fairly well to other techniques. Um, so in summary, the fidget spinner delivers upon its promise as an electricity-free, manually powered separation device with a stationary component to avoid unwanted vibrations. It's lightweight, non-bulky, and relatively inexpensive to purchase at a 50 cent cost per spinner. Compared to other techniques, sure, you get smaller plasma yield, but this can be accounted for by the lesser sample volume that you have to start with. And although a separation time of four to seven minutes is nothing special, that's still pretty quick in the long run. So perhaps the biggest disadvantage of these devices, it's their controversial reputation as dangerous toys or threats to America. But similar to other devices, once you are trained, you can see that fidget spinners are not something to fear. By federally mandated right to know laws, I'm obligated to inform you that fidget spinners are to be kept away from children scientists under the age of three, and that I must warn children scientists of all ages that fidget spinners are not something to put in your mouth or in your face. And so the authors didn't mention any potential future work for this study, but I came up with some ideas of my own. I was interested in studying different designs of fidget spinners with different amount of lobes per blood plasma separation to investigate the geometry effect, as well as some light catalyzed separations using LED fidget spinners. And so I just finally want to leave off with a note on functional fixedness, which is the psychological notion that a mental block prevents problem solving. It's easily an analytical scientist to view equipment only for its intended traditional purposes. However, as everyone goes on in their careers and analytical techniques continue to convolute, I encourage everyone to maintain open and creative minds and never simply view equipment as a means to an end. Kind of like life hacks, which take everyday items and use them for unconventional uses, I encourage you to create lab hacks for yourself. And perhaps everyday objects like the fidget spinner may have other latent uses. Keep spinning. <laughs>